welcome to Building Great Sales Teams, a show dedicated to making sales teams tick, tick, boom. Great sales teams are not recruited, they are built block by block. Let's get to work. All right, guys, I got Lori Seitz here, CEO of Zen Rabbit. She provides customized gratitude meditation for uh, CEOs and companies alike. She's the host of the podcast, uh, Fine is a Four-Letter Word, and a professional speaker. She's uh, spoken at events like Women Empowerment International, ARP, the Power Conference, and a bunch more that uh, would take all day to list here. <laughs> Lori, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Doug. Happy to be here. So uh, you spoke at a, a lot of events. Do you have any advice for uh, us that are just getting into speaking? I have my first speaking gig in August. Really? The, your yeah. very first speech? You haven't been on a stage before? Wow. Okay. I'm nope. surprised. I have not been on a stage before. All right. Well, my advice is practice more than you think you need to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was definitely going to practice in front of the family. I haven't. I don't. Okay. So. My friend Philip Sessions, which has a podcast about public speaking, um, he said, I've got a stage you can speak on. I want you to speak on it. But the only catch is you have to speak about legacy versus building great sales teams. Okay. So obviously, I don't have a format or a you know plan for that. So I've got to come up with the actual talk, too. But he, I talk about it a lot. You know what I mean? And he yeah. was just looking for a way to make me uncomfortable, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to do it. I mean, it feels really uncomfortable now, especially mm -hmm. thinking about it. And then once you uh -huh. get up there, I'm sure you'll be fine. So I would recommend coming up with some stories like, mm -hmm. you know, your base, you know, write an outline. Yeah. It, it cover three main points. You know, a lot of times speakers get up there and they just want to tell you everything. And right. It's too much for the audience to take in. So yeah. if you go up to, with three to five points. Mm -hmm. and have a story for each one. One of my very first speaking mentors was a legend in the speaking industry. He actually was one of the founders of the National Speakers Association. And oh, his nice. whole thing, yeah, his whole thing was make a point, tell a story. Because people remember stories. And so they'll remember mm -hmm. your points better if you have a story attached to each one. So put your and speech together that way. They get to take the nuggets home and then they post about them and they execute on them and then they reach out to you after. Right. Now that sounds great. So, so what's the, the backstory to let that led to all of this? All of what? <laughs> all of the Be, speaking being opportunities? The CEO, <laughs> being the CEO of Zen Rabbit, host of the podcast, professional speaker, like, you know, obviously, you know, were you, you were in the corporate world before, right? I was in corporate, but I was in entrepreneurial corporate. Okay. Like Explain I never worked for a company that was like, you know, on the stock exchange or had thousands of employees. The right. companies I worked for were very small. Mm -hmm. The biggest company had maybe 200 people and it was okay. very entrepreneurial. So like when we needed to get out a mailing, for example, the CEO might be on the floor helping us Heck stuff yeah. envelopes, you know? So, That's awesome. Yeah. So I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit surrounding me. My dad mm -hmm. was, my dad always had a for the most part, he, he did own his own hardware store when I was growing up, mm -hmm. like small business. Um, but even when he was working for somebody else, he always had a side gig. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with this entrepreneurial spirit um, and then working in these different, different places where I had a, you know, as an employee was also always still pretty entrepreneurial. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So and then go ahead. And what was your area of expertise at all these different positions? Marketing. Change? Marketing? Okay. Marketing. My background, um, 25 plus years in marketing. That makes a lot of sense. All your stuff is really well put together. I was going through it uh, a couple of hours ago and it looks great. So that, Thank you. that makes yeah. perfect sense. Branding and marketing. I'm all about that. And copywriting. Like actually when I graduated from college, that's what I wanted to do was to go work for an agency and be mm -hmm. a copywriter. And uh, so I love writing. I wanted to be Mel Gibson and what women want. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> I mean, but he was just a, like in his character in that, in that uh, movie, what he did, the creative director, you mm. know what I mean? 
Right. I love that part of it. And then I realized I wasn't creative. So, <laughs> okay, no, wait, no, no, no. Everybody is creative. You I are understand. just, you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit. I understand. But to, to that level, I guess I, you know, you can work at anything, right? Okay. So your program, I came across your program from uh, a podcast guest, a previous co- podcast guest that brought, brought a ton of value to the show, Donnie Bovine. And, um, he actually, at the end of the podcast, we stopped recording and everything. And he was like, you are all about gratitude. You have got to talk to Lori, you know? Yeah. And um, so we had the conversation uh, a couple of weeks later. Um, I hired you to talk to my company and uh, we got you set up for the 24th to, to come talk to my sales guys. And so tell me about your program and your program is called Fuck Being Fine. <laughs> yes, it is. So... <laughs> So uh, let's back up for a minute because the whole Mm -hmm. concept of gratitude, those are the first business that I started as Mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. I was selling a product called the gratitude cookie and it was based on a family recipe. They were like these cross between butter and sugar cookies. And oh, it's real cookies. They're real cookies. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about that. (laughs) Yeah. So here I am manufacturing a food product with no preservatives, all natural and it was never my goal to be the next Mrs. Fields. My goal was because of my marketing background, I'm like, how can I make this different? Mm -hmm. And so I made it a product for businesses to send to their clients and to their referral sources as a way to say thank you to them. Okay. So box of gratitude cookies inside each, each box had a card with a inspirational saying on it that was called, you know, gratuities and Mm -hmm. There was a hole and it, people were encouraged to think about something they were grateful for as they uh-huh. were eating the cookies. I mean, there was a hole. You're talking about I love like it. this branding thing. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so that that was my original foray into talking about gratitude because then I would go around and speak on stages and talk about gratitude for business and how to use gratitude to differentiate your business mm-hmm. in no, the marketplace. Because so few businesses say thank you to their clients or right. to people who send them referrals. And there's so much business left on the table by not doing that. I couldn't agree more. I mean, and doing it preemptively too, right? So yes. I, I read uh, John Ruin's Giftology. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever read that book, yep. but he talks a lot about that. And those gratitude cookies would be great for that to, you know, give them to a client before you even do business with them. Just yeah, to open in up fact, that. one of my best clients did that. He was, uh, Mm -hmm. his business at the time was to get rodents and animals and stuff out of people's attics. Like, you know, they go in there and they cause a tremendous amount of damage. Like they'll eat wires and they'll um, Mm -hmm. destroy the the walls and stuff out of, yeah. So he would have to, the jobs that he was getting were like $30,000 jobs. Uh And so he, people, but people had no idea that it was going to be that expensive. So he would come in and he would, you know, give them this thing. And then he would send them a proposal the next day with a box of gratitude cookies. (laughs) And he, he was also a copywriter and he had this letter that he had created that I would put into the package with it. Mm -hmm. And it would say something like, Hey, I know the proposal is pretty long. Take a few minutes to get, get a cup of coffee or a glass of milk. Here's a box of cookies to eat while you're going through this. Okay. So now the law of reciprocity kicks in. Do you know this law? Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So people get this box of cookies and they feel unconsciously, they feel obligated now to hire him. Not that he's, I mean, he's going to deliver on what he says and he's going to do a good job, but this kind of just puts it over the edge. Like you're saying, like using it proactively to get clients. He got tremendous amount of business by investing, you know, $50 to get a $30,000 job all day. Not only that, that law, which I have a hard time saying it, so I'm not going to attempt it right now, but there's that law. And then there's also the fact that as they're reading his proposal, they're getting dopamine hits from the sugar and the cookies, you know what I mean? So they're associating those, that dopamine with his name and his proposal, which is, is great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was my foray into gratitude. And then, mm -hmm. um, I ran that business for 11 years, couldn't quite scale it the way I wanted to. So I ended up shutting it down and in 2014 and at the Mm -hmm. same time, not because of, but at the same time, my mom was diagnosed with an acute form of leukemia and she passed away six weeks later. And so it was during then, like right after 
I was thinking about like, okay, I was thinking about my own life. Like, all right, do I want to keep doing what I've been doing for 20 years? Mm -hmm. It for the next 20 years or 30 years or however many, you know, nobody knows how long we have left. Um, right. It gave you perspective. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there was nothing wrong with those previous 20 years. It's just right. a reevaluation. Like, okay, what do I want to do now? Do I want to make this my life's work? Right. Right. Um, and so I actually ended up teaching networking strategies for a little while mm -hmm. until Donnie. pandemic came along. Yeah. That's how I met Donnie. Yeah, right. Awesome. I, he actually had me a, as a guest on his first podcast to talk about networking. Awesome. And he, a funny thing was he wasn't like, he wasn't into networking at that point. Mm -hmm. Like he was yeah. kind of like, yeah, all right, I'll talk to you, but I'm not networking. Isn't really a thing. And <laughs> look at what he's doing now. <laughs> right? Now, now look at what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So, um, but then pandemic came along and nobody was going anywhere. So uh -huh. I couldn't run a networking, a business teaching networking strategies. A little um, difficult. Yeah. Well, and my networking strategies were more for in-person things. That's right. Why it was that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Um, but at the same time, around the beginning of pandemic, I got asked to come do a presentation, virtual, of course, um, mm -hmm. on gratitude to help people kind of feel a little bit better about, you know, everything, feel a little better about what, everything that was going on. We were just going into lockdown and, yeah. you know, um, but invited back into that world to talk about gratitude again. And that pulled me back in. I ended up creating a five-day gratitude experience on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was doing challenges. And I was kind of like, June 2020, we're pretty challenged already. I don't think we need more. Yeah. I'm going to do an experience. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then started talking about gratitude again, more um, in a different way. Created a gratitude meditation, bringing in my, I have some background in broadcast as well. Okay. So bringing the broadcast and the meditation and the gratitude all together to create these, these meditations that then turned into uh, another thing that I do is just customized gratitude mm -hmm. meditations, um, which are customized for each individual person who, who um, wants one. And then that kind of led into, all right, now people are living this life where they are looking again, coming back to that reevaluation, like, is this how I really want to live? Everybody walks around saying, everything's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. How yeah. are you? I'm fine. You know, they're not, mm -hmm. but society just has trained us to just say, I'm fine. One, because you don't want to burden the other person. Like, Oh, right. well, let me tell you about my life. Like yeah. they don't really want to it's hear too much. It. Yeah, yeah. Too much. Um, and two, not admitting it to yourself. Like, Mm -hmm. If I don't want to open that Pandora's box, everything's fine. I'll just keep it all stuffed down there. It's a lot of work when you open it. It is. It's also a lot of work to keep it stuffed down. Absolutely. Absolutely. A, a, a lie takes just as much work as the truth, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So how so, did, how did all that, I guess, and what is fuck being fine? How did all that morph into it? And then what is the, the program that you've got? Yeah. So the, so it morphed into that because um, I was talking to all these people who were kind of reaching midlife. Like, you know, you end up talking to your peers and uh, they're all like, <laughs> they're, they're all kind of in that same place, like reevaluating their life. Like, well, where am I? Parents are passing away. Kids are growing up and moving out of the house and not needing people in the same way they needing their parents in the same way. Mm -hmm. And um People are kind of like looking at their spouse going, I don't know, do I even like you anymore? I, I, I think we're done. I'm, I'm out. Um, uh, which is what I did. Actually, I left uh, marriage after 22 years. Um, oh, man. Yeah. And so they, you get to this point where you're just like, I'm done being fine. And that's mm -hmm. why, I mean, it's called fuck being fine because you're just like, fuck, I can't live one more day at being fine, which is, you know, the equivalent of what? Mediocre or okay, uh, mm -hmm. it's just status quo. Like, eh. there has to be something greater, more expansive. And that our souls want that. Absolutely. Start, you, you know, your soul, the reason that you feel stuck in that place is because your soul is longing for something more. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times the people that I, were talking, I was talking to were like beating themselves up because look at my life. Everything is fine. Like 
I have a good home. I have a, you know, I, I'm not living on the street. You know, they have like a, everything looks from the outside really good. Yeah. And yet they don't feel fulfilled. And so they start right. asking themselves what something must be wrong with me. And that's kind of why I started the podcast too, was to help people understand one, there's nothing wrong with you. And two, you're not alone. No, that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. So the program is, um, there's, there are three pillars to the program. It's called the trilogy for success. And those pillars are gratitude, mm -hmm. connection, and under connection is most importantly, the connection to yourself. And that's where that meditation piece comes in. Okay. And third is courage and courage to do the thing. Cause once you start getting in touch with your inner truth, yourself, mm -hmm. you start hearing things like yeah. the things that you stuffed down before, <clears throat> and then you need the courage to actually carry them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I feel like this is like a 2.0, you know what I mean? When you, when you go through the development journey, you know, mm -hmm. for me, it was, it was 75 hard, right? Yep. So 75 hard created disciplines. And then from those disciplines came a limit to basically bullshit that was happening around me. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't accept it anymore. Right? right. And I let all those things go. And as you do that, you start hearing your inner voice more of what you want, right. you know? And I feel like this is like a 2.0 when you can quiet your mind down, get rid of all the work, get rid of all the personal stuff, the family, the friends, the distractions, and actually listen to yourself. You know, I think that can be huge for a lot of entrepreneurs, sales leaders, and salespeople for that. And uh, so I guess it kind of goes into my, my next question, which I somewhat answered, but I think you'll have a better answer. <laughs> Why should sales leaders care about meditation? Because this is the basis of success. So when you look at the highest performing business leaders in the world, mm -hmm. The majority of them practice meditation. I mean, people like uh, Richard Branson and mm. Ray Dalio, Bill Ford, chairman of Ford Motor Company, mm. uh, and, and athletes. If you want to like get into that too, you know LeBron James and um, Michael Jordan, Carly mm -hmm. Lloyd, soccer player. Um, they they all practice meditation, not because they have nothing else to do. These are busy people, <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's because meditation actually rewires your brain. It changes how your brain is wired so that you can be more focused. You talked about distractions. Mm -hmm. We live in a society that is rewiring your brain to be distracted. Social media. Did you ever see the movie, um, the documentary, uh, what's it called? The Social Dilemma on Netflix? Yes. Yes. Okay. So they talk about what the Silicon Valley companies and have done to consciously distract, you. distract and rewire your brain so that you are distracted and that you are focused on their thing. Like how many times can you go into Facebook and check your check updates? Yeah. And all of them have that. Um, the reason it shows up as, you know, you have 700 messages on Facebook or LinkedIn or anywhere is because they want your, your brain will go, I have to close that loop. And so it's got to right. go in and, and get rid of them. And we're so, all, we're all incredibly susceptible to it. You know, I, yeah. I consider myself a driven individual, but I still go down the reels and TikTok like, I don't know how to say it. Wormhole, <laughs> black yeah. hole. Yeah. And then all of a the sudden hole. Yeah. I, I look up and it's 45 minutes later. I'm like, what did I just do? You know? Right. And, right. and, and that was, that's the extreme version of it. You know, most of our lives, we've only had the little red notifications and the little dopamine hits we get from checking those. Right. Yep. But doing this, being able to scroll through as much as we want and always get new, new yeah. information and new media. I mean, right. our brains are just it's like crack to our brains, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that the, the designers of those programs know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So meditation allows you the opportunity to rewire your brain so that it works best for you, not for them, for you. So you're rewiring it, practicing meditation 
has been proven. There's so much science and research behind this. Like people are think, oh, meditation. Yeah. That's a thing that hippies do while they're sitting on a mat, you know, for hours a day, but there's so much science and research backing up all of this stuff that I'm talking about, that we're talking about it. Uh, it can lower your pain threshold, like physically, uh, help with pain. Mm. It makes you more emotionally intelligent. So you are less likely to get drawn into conflict. Think of how many, you know, clients all the time try to draw you into stuff, right? Yeah. Clients, vendors, um, employees, friends, family, <laughs> friends, everybody, right? Yeah. So if you're less likely to get drawn into conflict, your, your relationships improve. Mm-hmm. You have, you're better, fo- more focused. You're able to retain information better, which makes sense. Cause if you're better able to focus, then it makes sense that you're going to retain more information. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What are some other, I mean, there's so many benefits to it. Um, creativity. We were talking, we were talking about creativity, yeah. Medit- practicing meditation makes you more creative. You're more open to those ideas. Yeah. I feel like if I've, if I've consumed too much social media or, you know, that type of um, dopamine hit type reels and, and TikTok, you know, my, my brain is mush. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And then the only thing I can do is more of the same, right? Yeah. And then it turns into the cycle. Right. Um, and so for me, you know, I've, so I did, I just finished phase one of uh, the live hard year, the 75 hard program. And I had to do 10 minutes of visualization every day. Mm-hmm. And it was so freaking hard. It would take me yeah. 30 minutes someday. Cause I knew I was trying to stay in integrity and I knew when I wasn't doing business visualization yep. anymore, I was off in Neverland, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. the way the, my brain is not comfortable to just being, right. you know? And so what is just one strategy you can give us to actually just be, you know, what do you, how do you, I mean, that's easy to say, just be, you know, but I our know. brains oh, won't I allow know. it. Yeah, but, I know. I know. So one of the things to realize that I get also asked all the time is how do I clear all the thoughts from my head? Yeah, that's what I mean, essentially. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And it's not possible. Like we're human. So there okay. are always going to be thoughts coming through your head. But part of the practice of meditation is to recognize those thoughts and to mm-hmm. acknowledge them and to almost say to them like, hey, I see you. And okay. now I'm just going to let you keep going. Like, Like I can see in the mirror behind you, there are cars going Mm -hmm. on the, on the freeway there. Yeah. It's just like that. Like, those are the thoughts. They just keep passing. They just keep passing and you just let them go and don't get distracted by them. And when you find yourself getting distracted by them, you recognize, Hey, I'm getting carried away here. And -hmm. you come back to your breathing. That's a really easy thing to come back to and just focus on your breathing. You did, you did say that in a conversation last time. And then we talked about the, the breath work that I did at the RBO mastermind in St. George, Utah. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that, that makes so much sense, right? Because if your motor functions, if you're focusing on your motor functions, then that your, your brain tends to go not into autopilot, but if you consciously focus on that, then it helps. Like mm-hmm. for me, it's hard for me to read. Right. And so 75 hard is even harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, but what I, I'm really good at absorbing information when I'm driving, you know, so mm-hmm. podcasts, uh, audio books are great for me, but my yeah. motor functions are engaged. So my brain's more receptive to information at that point. Otherwise, like it's hard for me to sit still, you know what yeah. I mean? Right. Like, I'm, I'm 35 now. I've gotten better at it, but yeah, you know, that makes a lot so of sense. One of the other suggestions that I have for when people find it hard to sit still mm-hmm. is uh, two of them. Actually, one is before you go to sit down, put on a song that gets you super hyped, super pumped. And this is going to sound crazy. All right. So do it in a room. If you have to by yourself, no one can see you go in the bathroom, shut the door, Mm -hmm. dance, dance to this song and get that energy out. Like just get the energy out and then go sit. Okay. Or do a walking meditation. For example, if you have really hard time sitting still, then do a walking meditation. Now, the best way to do this, it's not the only way because everything I teach is not the only way. I encourage people to find the thing that works for them, Mm -hmm. but to go out in nature, find a trail or whatever, and 
no electronics. This is the hard part, right? Don't bring any electronics. Yeah. And walk in nature and pay attention to like the birds, you know, listening to the birds or hearing your feet, the sound your feet are making as they're walking through leaves or whatever, Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, pay attention to what you're seeing around you and to take, use your senses to take in all of that information as you're walking. That's the meditation. It doesn't have to be sitting in Mm -hmm. silence with your eyes closed and your feet crossed. So the closest I've come to that is uh, running and then mm-hmm. listening yeah. to uh, basically it's, it's, it's rap music, but it's been converted to like violins. Yeah. You know, oh so it's, gosh, cover, it's, cool. it's covers. Yeah. And so I really enjoyed that because I, I, I like something with the beat when I'm running. Yep. And so that helps me kind of clear my mind a little bit and kind of focus on what's going on in my life and work through problems and stuff like that. But yeah. Is that meditation? That is a form of meditation. Cause I used to run too. I didn't love it, but I would do it because you get in the best shape the fastest. So yeah. <laughs> that's why I would do it. But it's the same thing, right? You're getting into a rhythm mm-hmm. of your feet are at that pace. Yeah. And you're occupying your mind. And so I get yeah, right. The electronics, um, when you have some kind of music that kind of it almost puts you into a trance. I don't want to say that, but it, it is. It is trance like mm-hmm. you're not, you're not focusing on words because there's no words. There's yeah. all kinds of healing frequencies of music and what you're listening to sounds really cool too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really about clearing your mind again, not clearing all the thoughts necessarily out of just your let mind, it in pass clearing through. your mind to allow yourself just to just kind of relax mm-hmm. and open your mind to these creative ideas and to hearing that inner voice, that, that inner voice that only you can hear. Cause again, we are so inundated with all of the, the voices outside of us, mm-hmm. social media, our friends, our family, um, everybody has an opinion, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> and they want to tell you what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you what you should do. Mm-hmm. This is your opportunity to get in touch with your own inner voice and your own inner truth. And that never steers you wrong. That makes a lot of sense. So what are some ways that you've seen this help your employees, you know, other than increasing the quality of life, which in my opinion, absolutely will increase the quality of work, right? Mm -hmm. When they're happier in general, they're going to do better work and more effective and efficient work. Right. Um, Do you see any uh, benefits outside of that? I mean, that's what we want, right? Yeah. I mean, it's going to affect your life overall. Obviously, it's going to make you better at your job. Mm -hmm. It's also going to make you better at life. Because think about if somebody is bringing problems from home into work, they're not fully focused on what they're doing. Which is like part of the job in sales. I think it's part of the job to bring your drama to work. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I swear, because <laughs> my, you know what I mean, my my uh, partner and VP of sales, you know, he's a great counselor. That's why he's in that position. Uh huh. He intercepts a lot of that for me, you know. Right. <laughs> but right. I've 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 had to evolve and become better at it too. But it's 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 very difficult to get my guys to focus because they're so focused on all the drama at home or relationships or um, bills or whatever the case is, you know. Right. And so I think, I think this can help a lot. How can we institute this in our companies and, you know, for, for the purpose of this podcast, which it doesn't have to be specifically for building sales teams, but, but yeah, in in sales organizations, how can we institute this without them all rolling their eyes and saying, oh, this is Doug's on his woo woo stuff again. You know what I mean? (laughs) Right. Right. Well, I come back to look at that highest performing leaders. Okay. You know, if they're give doing them a point it, of reference, a point of reference, right? If, if these leaders are using meditation, they're practicing meditation and they're all open about it. It's not like it's mm-hmm. a secret or anything. And they will tell you that they attribute a large part of their success to the fact that they practice meditation. Like, mm-hmm. obviously you can't just practice meditation sit on the couch and expect bags of money and clients to come to you. Right. Still have to, <laughs> I'd like to, that would yeah. be awesome. 
yeah. but that's not how it works. You still have mm-hmm. to take action. But what you end up doing is taking something that I refer to as more inspired action. So instead of just being busy running around like a, you know, madman with his hair on fire, yeah, you're much more intentional about the action you're taking. You're, you're dialed in. You're dialed in. So you're not distracted because we already said that practicing meditation helps you improve your relationships, helps your mm-hmm. emotional intelligence, helps, helps you um, be more focused. So that drama may still exist, but you don't get drawn into it as much. Mm-hmm. And so again, then you have an easier time of leaving it where it is and coming in and being focused at work. But the other thing I was going to say is that it's, it's, do you believe in coincidences? I mean, I believe they mean something most of the time, <laughs> you know? Okay. When I mean, I, I, I honestly, I, I've had a lot of those lately and, yeah. I, and I think they're divine. Yeah. You know, I think okay. they're from God. Yeah. Yeah. So more of those things start happening. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I can attribute it to is you're more connected. Okay. You're more connected. And so more synchronicities start happening. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets kind of weird, but sales gets a little bit easier. Okay. I like that. (laughs) Because, because you may have almost like a sixth sense of who do I need to call on? And you start making, you know, you could be doing random phone calls or random Mm -hmm. door knocking or whatever, but you are just drawn to the right ones. So one of the things that happened when I started doing 75 hard and started doing visual visualization is I, I started feeling a lot more of people's energy, mm. you know, and I walk into a room and I meet someone and I can feel their energy. I know if they're for me or if it's not mm-hmm. good energy, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I a hundred percent agree with that. I can imagine if you go from, you know, doing a, a program like that to visualization, to meditation, and making it in a regular practice, a regular discipline, your energy meter has got to be like super dialed in at that point. And so yeah. you know where you belong and where you don't. Right. You're actually clearing those energy channels. So mm-hmm. now we're going to get really woo woo, but everything Let's is energy. Well, everything is energy, right? <laughs> yeah. We are energy. The table is energy. Everything is energy. And so when you start tapping into those, those, those energy um, silos, if you will, like, Mm -hmm. you know, talk about chakras in the body, you know, we all have all these energy points Um, when you are clearing them so that you can, again, have a a more clear channel. That's again, when things start showing up, you you can feel, you can feel that energy of other people when you are open to it. They don't have to be open to it. I mean, animals do this all the time, you know, dogs and cats walk into a room and they can tell right away. Like if a dog doesn't like you, it's picking up something from you. Yeah, absolutely. They don't don't just naturally not like people. (laughs) Something is going on. My dog knows when I'm having a hard time. Yeah. He'll come up to me and push his snout into me, you know what I mean? And kind of give me that energy that I need, you know, dogs are very good at that. They're very good. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. When you, when you said sh- chakra, I almost laughed because, you know, I, I told you I'm part of Ryan Steuben's network. Yeah. And one of his videos that he put out was him and Danny Galvez, which is his like yeah. hype man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Danny's like taking pictures in front of his Lambo. And he's like, if you just align your chakras, you can get a Lambo. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and it, it's, it's hilarious it because we know that you need that and work. Right. We know that you need prayer and works, right. And meditation and execution, you know, and, and so many people try and do one or the other and you kind of need both, you know, because you could do all work and you're going to burn yourself out and your, your, your energy is going to be off and and you're not going to be focused and dialed in and disciplined. Right. Right. Whereas if you're doing both, then you can, you can accomplish more intentionality, like you said. Yeah, I, I see this so many times in sales organizations, especially, is mm-hmm. that hustle 24-7 mentality. Yeah. Like yeah, absolutely. I'm just gonna push and push and push and screw it with the the woo-woo stuff. I don't need that crap. Yeah. You can succeed pretty, you could get pretty, you know, 
multi-million dollars you can yeah. get to doing that. However, what is what are you sacrificing to do that in terms yourself. of health? Right. Yourself. You know, and, and it goes with your core values too. You can succeed stepping over people and you can succeed um, cheating on your wife. You know what I mean? You can succeed uh, stealing from your business, whatever the case is to a certain point, you know, and, I, and you could probably become a billionaire some, someday, but you're going to be dead inside. Absolutely. You're literally going to be miserable, you know? Yeah. And this is part of the reason why you see so many um, successful business people, celebrities, this happens a lot. Mm -hmm. You see, they're miserable. They're mm -hmm. hugely successful and they're miserable. And then what do they turn to? They turn to like the worst things possible in yeah. order to try and find some type of pleasure or find try and yeah. find some type of meaning, you know? Right. Right. Wow. That, that, that did take a woo -woo turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's I want to very... go back to something you said. Sure. Sure. When you talked about visualization, so uh -huh. visualization is a form of meditation. Like you don't have to always be visualizing in a meditation, right. but visualization can be meditation. And do you know why visualization works so well? Cause you're focused on what you're visualizing. I mean, cause there's a point yeah. of focus. Yeah. From a scientific standpoint, it's like setting a GPS for your brain. Mm -hmm. And so you're focusing on this thing. You're saying where you want to, you know, where I'm going at this. And then your brain is actually throughout the rest of the day, as you're going about your day, doing things is looking for ways to make what you have visualized reality. That's one of the biggest things I learned last year is when you, you know, when you say what you want, when you visualize it, when you meditate on it, when you pray on it, you know, your subconscious stores, all of that. Yeah. Right. And your, and, and your subconscious, like you said, will start making decisions based on your GPS, just like you're saying. And it's, you know, it's, it's crazy. I've done, I think this is probably going to be like podcast number 30 something. Uh, at MDM, we did a lot. I had the podcast trailer, you know, so we did a lot. And so I'm pretty nice. banked right now, but uh, probably half of them, we talk about some form of this, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. success leaves clues, you know, right. that's what I love about doing this podcast is I get either affirmation or new ideas that I can affirm later on and other with other uh, successful individuals. So that mm -hmm. this is great. I appreciate it. Yeah. So as far as your, your company Zen rabbit, what's, you know, obviously you've got to create product. You know what I mean? We're going to, we're going to use it ourselves. Um, what is the best way besides bringing you in and having you talk to the team that a, a CEO or a sales leader can execute on this? Is it just being the example or is there like an actual, like, you know, piece of paper you give them and say, Hey, do this. You know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you get it, this to infiltrate your company culture? I believe it does start at the top, you know, mm -hmm. like anything, you can't be a leader who tells their people to go do this thing and you not do the thing. Right. That's not going to, you know, do as I say, not as I do doesn't right. really it's work, not well. work very long. Yeah. No. And because they're looking to you to see if you're going to carry out what they're going to do. Like when I was talking about, you know, at the beginning of our conversation of that CEO who would get into the trenches with us and you know, he, it was funny because he was this Swiss guy and he wears a suit every, didn't matter what day it was. If it was a hundred degrees, he's wearing a suit. Wow. And he was very formal. It, well, it was a financial services company. So they were formal to start with. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But to see him, you know, he's in there doing the things because that's the leader he was. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you have to set the standards mm -hmm. and be that, be that person. Yeah. And it's so powerful. It really is. I had, um, two people over the last two days in my sales organization, uh, start 75 heart mm -hmm. over the last couple of days, you know? So it is, it's a constant topic, you know, that yeah. we talk about and, you know, I do, I talk about my story, you know, and how I've changed my life and how big 75 heart was in order to do that. Mm -hmm. I attempted it six times and finally did it the seventh time. So I found yeah. out all kinds of stuff about myself through that and, yeah. and found the weak points to work on, you know, and one of them is visualization, meditation, 
And so I'm, I'm very excited about working on that with you. Yeah. Um, go ahead. To go back to, to answering that question though, there are so many books, there are so many podcasts, there's so many resources out there about mm-hmm. implementing gratitude and meditation okay. into a business perspective. So one of the books that actually got me back into meditating in back um, shortly after my mom had passed away. So Mm -hmm. my mom took my brother and me to a meditation course when I was 10 years old. So I've known about meditation forever, but I didn't practice it. I didn't even think about that. I didn't get my kids in on this. Absolutely. I mean, it's such a great foundation for them because I mean, kids, especially what, what's going on now. I mean, always, there's always something in the world, right. Um, but to giving, give them that base to, uh, to get grounded Mm -hmm. again, grounded, no matter what's going on around them, they can't control circumstances, but they can control themselves and how they respond. This is another thing that meditation does is it teaches you and allows you to be calm so that you can respond instead of react off the cuff. Um, but yeah, so she had taken us to this course. So I had this background, but I never, I didn't practice it for all these years. And then I was introduced to this book called the code of the extraordinary mind. Are you familiar with it? No, I'm not. Vision, vision Lakiani is the founder of a company called mind Valley. Oh yeah. You know, know mind Mind Valley, Valley. right? Okay. So vision is the founder. I'm a member of Mind Valley. Okay, really cool organization. Yeah. So that's another resource that people can use to tap into mm-hmm. to learn more about all of this stuff. Um, but he, in this book, he talks about using meditation and how it made him a better salesperson, actually. Okay. Um, for the reasons that we talked about, that he, he was doing cold calling out of the yellow pages back in the day. And he would just have to go through pages and pages of yellow, yellow pages, um, and pick people to call. Mm -hmm. So after he started practicing meditation, he was getting better at, again, it was still randomly picking numbers, right? But he was getting a better response rate. So numbers on the, the numbers on the page have an energy, you know what I mean? Like (laughs) that's exactly it. And the funny thing was, so the, the course that my mom took my brother and me to is now known as the Silva method. Silva method. Okay. That was the same program that vision went through uh, and vision now has some kind of affiliate. He might own it, but um, okay. his mind Valley teaches the Silva, Silva method. method. Yeah. It's just a coincidence. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, he talks in that book about, um, about how that changed his life. My, my Practicing a, meditation. I'm glad you brought that up because it really had fallen off my radar and I paid for a year of it already and I haven't been using it. And okay. uh, I need to get back on there because they have amazing resources for everything you could think of. So many you know, good courses. It's there. like a, it's like a, an entrepreneurial masterclass, you know what yeah. I mean? And you've got a whole library of it at your disposal. Yeah. So it's almost a little overwhelming how much they have on it there. is. And I think that's what it was for me. I started out, I, I got brought in from an ad for, um, uh, focus. And I think it's, uh, Neil Nectal, um, or Nihal. I can't, I can't remember how to pronounce his last name, but he had a, a course on, uh, uh, organization and, and focus and, uh, basically blocking out your calendar mm, okay. and, uh, staying true. And I've been practicing it since staying true to what's on your calendar at that time. Yeah. And then that way you can go home and actually be present, you know, right. and uh, because that's your time, you blocked it out to be with family. So you can give yourself permission to actually be with family, you know? So it's that whole principle and he's got a course in there on it. And that's what kind of what brought me to mind Valley. And of course they're like, you know, $200 for the course or $400 for the year for everything, right. you know? Right. <laughs> so How why would I no get to that? Right. <laughs> got me. <laughs> give me the whole buffet. Right. Exactly. So, uh, what's next for, for Zen rabbit? What's next for Zen rabbit? So much going on right now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I do private client work. I do, I do a small group that I just launched my small group program. A few weeks ago, I launched cohort one cohort two is starting 
in mm-hmm. just a couple more weeks. So where, um, where are you based out of? I'm in Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. But uh, this is wh- all done virtually. One of my friends has a, has a, she just started a drone farm out there. A drone farm? A drone farm. So it's a place for uh, clients to come and either practice their drone aviation Okay. Or um, for her internal people that are outsourced to other clients that need drones or need drone photography or whatever the case is to practice there as well. So it's it's a it's a place to basically an, an airfield for drones. Wow. Okay. That's cool. You can't, I thought you can't fly over DC, obviously. You right. know what I mean? Yes. So they need they need somewhere to practice. Okay. And so um, it's it's really cool. But she came from she came from HR and and started a drone farm. Just wow, totally that's like crazy. Yeah. I, really I cool. thought maybe they were raising drones there. Like I know that on your episode with Donnie, you guys were talking about raising goats and chickens. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> not raising drone drones. farm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So you've got uh, your, your cohort programs going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. That, and then the corporate programs like I'm doing with you. Uh-huh. Um, and then there's even a more expanded one that is, um, more in depth, okay. but coming into companies and sharing this with sales teams or um, actually some of the the diversity DEI diversity equity and inclusion groups. Okay. Um, going in there and because they are always looking for programming, and okay. again, you know, teaching a lot of times people in corporate entrepreneurs have more resources, tend to be more exposed to this kind of thinking mm-hmm. more than people in companies, in corporate jobs do. And so yeah, being able to get in there and teach some of these t- tools and techniques to people who are working in, in corporate. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Could, I mean, it's, this is the thing I get so excited about it because yeah. imagine, imagine what our world would be like if everyone could be, could come from this place of calm and groundedness. You had said that earlier, and that's the next thing I wanted to say was like, imagine what the world would be like if we all assessed from a calm place and reacted, and not reacted, but what, what did you say earlier? Respond. Responded instead of reacted. Yeah. I mean, the world would be completely different. So much different. And it's possible. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of work to do. So I love the, the place of impact that you're coming from. Um, and speaking of that, you know, I've gotten into this habit now at the end of the podcast, I ask a very specific question. And that question is, in terms of legacy, you know, what do you see for yourself? Yeah, I, that's, that's my legacy. I don't have kids. So mm-hmm. it's not a matter of leaving a legacy through a family. That makes sense. Yeah. Leaving a legacy through my work, through my work with other people. Mm-hmm. And maybe a lot of those other people do have families. And yeah. so how it trickles down, because, you know, if parents are stressed out and fried all the time, mm-hmm. they put that onto their kids. So if they can come from that more calm and grounded place, and like my mom did, I mean, that was crazy back in the day when she took us, like nobody was talking about meditation, right? giving them that foundation so that then they can grow up and in, in a more calm and grounded way, you know, not flip out every time a test doesn't go their way, or they don't get um, chosen for the team they want to be on or whatever it is. This is, this is, you know, and it's all coming together now. This is, this will be amazing for my middle son because uh, he is very much like me, uh, except he also has his mom's emotional swings you know what I mean and so like he's very driven and very passionate and then when things don't go his way he loses it Mm. you know what I mean and so like you're you're talking about how it can affect your kids and you know when I think about my 20s before I started my development journey and before I started trying to become a better human Mm -hmm. and I would react to my kids versus respond you know and now I'm getting better at responding but meditation could could take me even further in that journey. And then, yeah, if I do it with my kids, especially my middle son, I think he gets so much out of it. And yeah. so I'm, I'm very excited about it and uh, very thankful that you've come on the, the podcast. It's an, impacted me a lot. And I've got 
a lot of work to do with it now too. So yeah, there's some you. really cool resources for um, teaching kids meditation as well, or meditations okay. that are created specifically for kids. Okay. Um, can you reference one and we'll make yeah, sure to put so it in the podcast one of, one of my favorite apps is called Insight Timer. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, there's a free version and a paid version. I don't, the free version is really more than adequate. Okay. Um, and they have kids meditations on there. Very cool. And so, yeah, you could start off with, you know, a five minute meditation for kids. Fantastic. All right, Lori, we're going to wrap up the podcast here. How do, how do uh, our listeners get a hold of you so they can take advantage of some of the, the resources that you have? The best way to reach me is one through my website, which is zenrabbit.com. And then I, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. So you can find me on okay. LinkedIn as well. Fantastic. And um, it's Lori, S-A-I-T-Z? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Well, Lori, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Doug. All right, let's get building. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Building Great Sales Teams. Be sure to appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you consume podcasts. This way you'll get notifications as new episodes become available. Remember, great sales teams are not recruited. They are built block by block. Until next time.